Amen. All right. You ready for this one, Joey? Yeah. Okay. That's a good answer. That's right. Uh, here's what happened. It all began with an incredible time of peace, right? Like never before in the history of mankind. And I mean, and surely this was the long-awaited utopia the world had been waiting for. I mean, it was peace and safety, peace and safety, peace and safety, right, Tom? Yet like birth pains upon a pregnant woman, instead, instantly their so-called utopia turned into a living nightmare. Suddenly across the world, men began to slaughter one another. One-fourth of the earth began to be annihilated by the sword, by famine, by plague, by even wild beasts eaten alive. Those who survived this first wave of destruction only wish they hadn't, but the next thing you knew, one-third of the earth burned up, one-third of the trees burned up, all the green grass burned up, then a third of the seas turned to blood, a third of the sea creatures died, one-third of the fresh water became bitter, one-third of the sun, the moon, the stars were dark and causing even more people to die. And then when you thought it couldn't get any worse, suddenly a five-month invasion of evil, wicked demons tormented people with pain so bad that they wanted to die, but they couldn't. Death actually eluded them. But that was just the beginning. Even more amounts of wicked demons were unleashed, this time to kill another one-third of humanity with fire and smoke and brimstone gushing out of their mouths like a river. And, and surely this was the last of it. The people cried out, but soon they discovered they still hadn't seen anything yet. Ugly, painful sores broke out on people, causing pain inside and out. The, the whole sea turned into blood. Every single living thing in it died. The sun intensified the people. They were seared with scorching fire. They gnawed at their tongues in agony. And then there was an earthquake so big the entire planet shook every city on the planet was destroyed every island disappeared every mountain fell into the sea uh, it was destroyed fell down the huge hailstones started to fall out of the sky crushing people like bugs on a windshield and then the birds gorged themselves on their flesh the book is revelation the judgment is the seven-year tribulation now, how many guys have ever heard of the seven-year tribulation before a couple of you especially you've been here we talk about prophecy once in a while Okay, and how many guys would say, man, that doesn't sound like a very fun time? Okay, and again, I'm just hitting the highlights of that. Okay, it is a time as we've been seeing, been seeing on Sundays too, uh, where Almighty God pours out his wrath on a wicked and rebellious planet, right? And that's just a synopsis of what's been written in the Bible for over 2,000 years, right? It's, it's not like it's just come out yesterday. 2,000 years for mankind, generation after generation after generation to read it and take note. And when you read it, folks, I don't know, to me, the logical conclusion is people should stand up, take notice when God warns them about this coming judgment. Those events, folks, are really coming to this planet. And you would think that people would rightly conclude, hey, man, I better get right with God now so I don't suffer the coming judgment of God, right? The problem is, folks, that's no longer the case. In our scoffing, skeptical, anti-God, anti-Christian society... Okay, people today are not only having a hard time, if you will, believing in God, but if there is one thing our world absolutely refuses to believe in, that's a coming judgment from God. Have you noticed that? I might flirt with the idea that there is a God, but don't you dare tell me that there's a coming judgment of God. Okay, therefore, in order to help these people out, we're going to continue our study, the witness of creation. Okay, and as we've been seeing, folks, we're taking a look at different evidences of creation that God's left behind for us to let us know he's not just real, praise God, but we really can have an intimate relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Anybody excited about that? Okay, now the theme is also going to be before it's too late. Okay, because one day the door is going to be shut, the hammer's coming down, and you just made the biggest mistake of your life. You will go into the seven-year tribulation if you're not born again. Now, we've already seen several different ways as a loving father. He's let us know this amazing truth, and that first evidence was the evidence of an intelligent creation or intelligent design. 10 weeks on that. The second evidence we saw was the evidence of a young creation. Six weeks on the evidence, we have not been here for millions and billions of years. That's a lie. Okay, and then speaking of lying, we did another six weeks on the evidence of a special creation. God says that we were created for a special purpose, to have a special relationship with him. Evolution says, no, nope, here's your whole purpose. Uh, you are nothing, you came from nothing, you go nowhere, uh, you have no meaning and purpose or value to life. Yeah, it's not very motivational. As we saw, it's not just not, not motivational, uh, and it's hopeless, but it's based on hoaxes. There is no evidence, and as we took a look at all their mechanisms, from natural selection, embryology, you name it, even punctuated equilibrium last week. Uh, folks, it's all a bunch of lies. Okay, It doesn't even work if you give them all the time that they want, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? But now we come to the fourth evidence showing us this amazing truth that we really can have an intimate relationship with God Okay, before it's too late, and that's the evidence of a judge creation. In other words, God judged this planet once before through a worldwide flood, okay, that we call Noah's flood, but it came from God. Okay, Noah didn't cause it, okay? It wasn't like Joey and he left that water on back there. Dude, I mean, that's a lake. 
No, I'm just kidding you. But anyway, that's right. Uh, but, you know, uh, God is the one. It's, it's, it's the one who created the flood, okay? But the point is God really did judge this world one time, the whole planet, because of sin. So when he says he's going to do it again, you better take notice, okay? But I didn't say that. He did. Let's open your Bibles to 2 Peter chapter 3. This is going to be our opening text. 2 Peter chapter 3 clearly ties in the first judgment with the second judgment, okay, is what uh, Peter's going to share with us. And Peter's also going to tell us, unfortunately, even though there's tons of evidence for that, the society just before the second judgment happens is going to be a scoffing society, a skeptical society. And it's good that we have no signs of that today. Yeah, or whatever. Okay, let's take a look there. Second Peter. If you find uh, First Peter, what do you do? Hang a right or go further. Uh, Second Peter chapter 3, verse 1 through 7 okay, is going to be our account here. When you get there, say moo. And it's talking about the day of the Lord. Now, this is a day you don't want to be a part of, okay? But it's a day of the Lord. Let's take a look at how the first uh, judgment happened and what people think about it today. Here's what he says. Now, dear friends, this is my second letter to you, okay? I've written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to whole, uh, wholesome thinking. And I want you to recall words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles, okay? So in other words, pay attention. This isn't the first time we've talked about it, but it's so important I'm writing to you about it again. Do you think it's important to know repeatedly that Jesus Christ is coming back? Do you think it's important to know that God is going to judge this planet? Yes. Why? Because the logical conclusion is if we forget, folks, that we are not saved for this garbage dump, we're going to dig all of our stakes into here. We're going to live like it. And we're going to give the impression to the world that this is all there is. No, we've been saved for a better place. Second of all, we're going to get complacent. And we're going to get complacent in sin. But when you realize Jesus Christ can come back any moment and get us, don't want that to be your last thing on earth, right? So he's, he's saying the same. I repeat, this is not my, we're, we're going into this again. God judges planet once. He's going to do it again. What, what's that mean? God hates sin. God doesn't mess with sin. God doesn't play with sin. Sin is serious. All right, so here he goes on. Now, first of all, you must understand that in the last days, what's going to come? Scoffers. And here's what it's all going to be about. Not because of a lack of scientific data, right, or evidence, but they're going to be scoffing, he says there, following their own evil desires. They don't want there to be a God, okay? They will say, well, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since their fathers died, everything goes on as it has since the beginning of creation. Doesn't that sound like today? All you Christians have been saying, Jesus is coming back. How many times? What do I, why should I listen now? Right? It's the same skeptical, scoffing society. Okay? But they deliberately forget. Now, what does that mean? Deliberately, deliberately forget. One guy's translation was dumb on purpose. Right? You, you on purpose, even though there's plenty of evidence, there's no reason for you to scoff, you don't want there to be a God, so you deliberately choose to follow something ridiculous. Okay, that's evolution, folks. They deliberately forget. What do they forget, though? That long ago, by God's word, the heavens existed and the earth was formed out of water and by water. Okay? By these waters also, the world at that time was what? Deluged and destroyed. Okay? So they forget on purpose that God's the one who created the heavens and the earth. He's the creator, and they also forget on purpose that God really did wipe out the planet by a flood, okay? He says, now, by the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction on who? On ungodly men, okay? So what we see in our Bible, the God says that he is not only God who will judge his creation because of sin, but the Bible clearly says that he's going to what? He's going to do it again, but he's already done it, Right? He's not going to just do it in the future. He's already done it in the past. The Bible says the first time it was with a worldwide flood. The second time it's going to be with a worldwide fire. Okay? And so again, here's the point. You would think that a person would conclude reading this or even a Christian telling them this, they would say, well, hey, man, I better get right with God so I don't suffer the coming judgment of God, right? That's what you would think. Unfortunately, the same book, the Bible that they scoff at, predicted their reaction in the last days. The Bible says, that's the irony. The Bible says those who are alive in the last days aren't going to be, if you will, with all due respect, smart people. They're going to be scoffing people. Okay, scoffing people. They're going to be willingly ignorant about the facts of the first judgment, and therefore they're going to seal their fate with the second judgment. 
It's not because there wasn't enough information. It's not because they just didn't have enough scientific data. It's not because there wasn't evidence. They didn't want there to be a God. They willingly turned away from the facts, from the truth, and they sealed their own fate. Okay? And so in order to help these scoffing people, hopefully become smarter people, uh, we're going to take a look at a whole bunch of evidences that there really was a worldwide flood, i.e., God really judged the planet, the whole planet, because of sin, and therefore you better wake up and pay attention when he says he's going to do it again. You better get ready. You better make sure that you're in the ark of Jesus Christ. Okay, the first evidence of a judge creation is the evidence of a global catastrophe. Okay, the evidence of a global catastrophe. Okay, and it works like this. To me, it's just kind of logical. You would think if there really was a worldwide flood, i.e. a global catastrophe, then gee whiz, you'd think somewhere, somehow, some way, we'd find some global evidence of it, right? Well, guess what, Joey? We do. That's right, we do. Uh, you're on the ball now. You're back on track. I'm feeling comfortable, okay? Uh, we do. Tons of it, okay? Scoff no more, okay? And the first evidence of a global catastrophe, there really was a worldwide flood, is the evidence of language, okay? Uh, the evidence of language, okay? Now, let's go back to the Genesis account, and let's start tearing it apart, okay? If this is true, it should be able to uh, hold up to the evidence, and of course, uh, shocker, it does. Genesis 11. Now, this is the account of the Tower of Babel, okay? This is after the flood, as we know. Mankind hit a restart button. Eight people started to populate the earth again. But right afterwards, they didn't listen to God. God said, get out there, repopulate the planet. Right after the flood, they start building a tower, okay? But notice why, apparently, they were able to do such a great work so quickly. It talks about the language of the time. Genesis 11, verse 1 through 4. Now, the whole world had what? One language and a common speech, Okay? And as men moved eastward, they found a plain in Shinar, and they settled there. Now, they said to each other, Come, let us make bricks and bake them thoroughly. And they used brick instead of stone and tar for mortar. Okay, then they said, Come, let us build a city, uh, build ourselves a city with a tower that reaches to the heavens, so that we may make a name for ourselves and not be scattered over the face of the whole earth. Whoops. What did God say to do? This is right after the heels of the flood. Right, And here we see in our text, folks, it's clear that right after the flood of Noah, once again, mankind, what? Rebelled against God. Can you believe that? I mean, you think that a worldwide flood would get your attention. But here they are, once again, they rebelled, they went eastward, they built this city. Now, here's the point. They didn't just build a city, but apparently there was this great cooperation. They can get a lot of things done very quickly. But it says they built a city, and at that same time, they had one common language, Right? Now, this is kind of a side note. I don't know if you've noticed with the technology today, just in time for the Antichrist kingdom before the second coming of Jesus, have you noticed that we're going back to one language? I don't know if you've ever done this. I mean, we still have multitude of languages, but now with the birth of computers and the internet, the language barriers are coming down. Uh, they have instruments now, folks, that it can instantly translate uh, another language. So you and I don't even have to learn it anymore. It can be translated very quickly for us. And in fact, one of the easy low-tech ways you can do it, you can go to like babblefish.com or some of these other websites, or even just Google now does it oftentimes automatically. We'll click a button, it'll automatically translate a page into the language. That's common now. But we get emails and things from people around the country, and I'm going, well, that looks German to me. So I'll go there and I'll cut and paste, what, push a button. Oh, I can read it. I don't have to learn German. I don't have to learn languages. The language barriers are coming down once again, just in time before the second coming of Jesus, with technology, we're going back to another time of rebellion. One language, and mankind's going to rally around the Antichrist. But that's a side question. But anyway, here's the point. Do we see any kind, right? This is what happened after the worldwide flood, the flood of Noah. Do we see any kind of evidence that there really was a time when mankind had a common language? Uh, yeah, we see a lot of that, okay? And we're going to see that in a couple different ways. Uh, the first one is the linguistic evidence, okay? And this is secular research. This isn't just Christians putting this together. It's secular researchers, okay? Due to the advances in the study of languages, or what's called philology, say that five times real fast. You actually did it, Joey. Give it up for Joey. I can't. It's awesome. That's all right. All right. <laughs> we now know that all languages can be traced back to what researchers, they've, they've labeled this, not me, researchers called the mother tongue. Interesting, okay? Uh, one such researcher is a guy, Max Mueller. He's one of the world's top language experts. Uh, he taught at Oxford, and he wrote in his book, so this is the, the, one of the top guys in the world, Science of Language, 
Okay, and he wrote this, quote, We have examined all possible forms which a uh, language can assume, and we now ask, can we reconcile the admission of one common origin of human speech? I answered decidedly what? Yep, exactly like the Bible said. That's the top expert uh, in the world. Uh, another guy, uh, Dr. Harold Steigers, he wrote this. He says, though there are countless languages and dialects, approximately 3,000 3, currently known, continued studies have revealed that there must be a common ancestor. Okay, there has to be at one point a single language. Dutch scholar Gerald Alders he said a he's a, a he said a famous Assyriologist made the amazing discovery that there's a clear relationship between the languages of the native people in Central and South America, and some of the islands and the ancient Sumerians, the oldest known language, and the Egyptian languages. This scholar, listen to this, who had formerly considered the account of Genesis 11, 1 through nine, the Tower of Babel, to be no more than a myth. Once he looked at the evidence, here's what he said came to the conclusion that the biblical narrative is much more credible than had been supposed. So even the secular experts are saying, hey, guess what? The Bible is accurate. Not that long ago, there really was one language, right? And that was right after the worldwide flood. Then they've applied computers to it. Modern day linguistic scientists are using computers to compare world's various languages. So now they can get down to the nitty gritty, okay? And uh, based on what they discovered, here's what the, they had to say, quote, Maybe the Bible is right, and there really was a Tower of Babel. Or at least, maybe there really was once a single human language before we were all cursed with their own words, a confusion of tongues. So even applying science to it, they're saying, wow, there really was, not that long ago, a single language. Exactly like the Bible says, right after the first judgment of the worldwide flood. Now let's take a look. at This is fascinating. If you want more material on this, right over there is the incredible Robert Tozier. Yay! Done, he's got some uh, great research done on the Oriental language. It's your plug for tonight. I'll give you a piece of gum later. Uh, but uh, take a look at the Oriental evidence, okay, that we know that there not only was a common language, but what you find is when you look in the uh, uh, Oriental evidence is you find the flood account embedded into the language, okay? So let's take a look at that. According to the Harvard Chinese Japanese Library, written Chinese dates back to approximately 2500 B.C., Okay, which just so happens to be pretty close to the time of the end of the flood, right? So for those who hooked on math, there, there it is. And this is when, logically, all languages would have had their common origin, right? So that's, that's another interesting thing. Now, what's amazing is that the Chinese language is not only pictorial, but it hasn't changed much over the passage of time. So it stayed pretty steady. What's odd about it is the Chinese picture words speak about Noah's flood. It's literally embedded into their language. And this is one of the earliest languages on the planet, hasn't hardly changed much, even fits the dates of the biblical flood, right? So let's see what's embedded early on and still today in the Chinese language, all right? The Chinese word for boat is depicted by eight mouths or eight people inside of a container. What do you think that is? That's the art embedded in the Chinese language still today. The Chinese word for total is uniting of eight people who joined hands over the earth. Why eight people? How many people survived on the ark? Eight people. Very interesting. Uh, the word for empty in Chinese is made up of two words, cave and work. Cave is depicted as how many? Eight people under one roof. Some would say this shows that when Noah and his family left the ark, they first moved into a cave for shelter, hence eight people under one roof. Then they left the cave each day to work at emptying the ark, and then they shared this post-flood experience with future generations, which eventually found its way into the Chinese language. That's kind of interesting. Uh, the Chinese character uh, for devil is formed from three characters put together, man, garden, and private. Genesis chapter 3, the Garden of Eden account, where the devil came in and uh, tempted Eve. The words, this is, this is wild, the words rebellion and confusion in Chinese link together the words for tongue and walking. So when the people rebelled, as we saw in Genesis 11, God confused their tongue, their language, and they went to uh, walking. Still embedded in the Chinese language today. And I'll share just one more. And this isn't all of them. This is the highlight. Uh, the word for garden or field in Chinese is a square. And inside that square is a, like a plus four, you know, just a plus sign. Okay, radiating outward. Uh, according to Genesis 2, a river in the Garden of Eden flowed outward in four streams and watered the entire garden. But as we all know, that's just common knowledge. You find that on the back of Cheerios every morning when you're reading that nifty thing. Now, it should be, right? 
But I would say that that linguistic evidence, folks, is not only interesting when it comes to the fact that God really did judge this world once with a worldwide flood. I'd say that uh, if you took a look at that evidence, and if uh, you saw it, or if a Christian shared that with you, and you still walked away scoffing, it's not because you didn't have the evidence. It's because you did exactly the irony, exactly what the book that you're scoffing at said you would do. You are willingly ignorant. Here's the fact steering you right in the face. God judges planet once. He's going to do it again. You better get into the ark of Jesus Christ. But you said, nope, nope. And you willingly turned the other way and you sealed your own fate. Okay? So that's the other thing. The second evidence of a global catastrophe is the evidence of not only linguistics, it's also the evidence of lineage. Okay? Now let's go back to Genesis 11 and keep reading because there's another thing we need to put to the test if in fact this is true. Genesis chapter 11, verse five through nine. But the Lord came down. Remember, they, instead, they didn't do what he said to do. They, they built this tower, had one common language. But the Lord came down to see the city and the tower that the men were building. And the Lord said, if as one people speak in the same language, okay, they've begun to do this, then nothing they plan will uh, do will be impossible for them. Now that's a whole nother side note. Uh, really in, 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 a, in a backhanded way, if you will, what God is saying, that's the power of unity. You catch that? The power of unity. Now, mankind was using that unity during this time to rebel against God. Flip it around to today. That's the power of a church and Christians being united. The things that we could do for Jesus when we're united in him, speaking with one heart, one mind, one Lord, one baptism, as Paul says, one goal, one direction, great things can take place. Hey, it's almost like what's happening at sunrise. That's right, Mary, I saw you say that. It's like what's happening at sunrise. It's a neat thing. But anyway, let's continue on. So nothing's going to be impossible with him, okay? So come let us, uh-oh, who's us? That's God, Elohim, plural. That's God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. There's your Trinity right there. The second time in the Genesis account. Come let us go down and confuse their language so they will not understand each other. So the Lord scattered them from there over all the earth and they stopped building the city. Okay, so imagine the scenario of going on. So here you are saying, hey, Joey, give me the hammer. And he's supposed to say, sure, Pastor Billy, it's right here. But what came out of his mouth supernaturally was, hong jong, hong jong. And so I look at him and say, excuse me, dude, did you get hit in the head with the hammer? And he's going, hong jong, jong. And then he turns to Tom, and Tom starts talking, oh, I don't know, some German thing. I don't know, Tom. <laughs> and then it's just like, What? right? And instantly destroyed their unity, okay? This is a supernatural event. Now, as we're going to see, even that is recorded in other cultures around the world. It's fascinating stuff. So that's why it's called Babel. So we get the word Babel, Babylon, Babylon, even the city, but you Babel, 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 is, is where it comes from. Because the Lord confused the languages of the whole world. So that's what he did to mess up their plans. Now, from there, the Lord scattered them over the face of the whole earth, okay? So that's the rest of the Tower of Babel account. And according to uh, the scripture, what we see is right after this event, okay, uh, God, once again, mankind's rebelling against him, okay, shocker, and so he has to go down, he's got to mess up their plans, he confuses their languages, and so here's the point. What did that confusion, why did he do that? He specifically picked something, obviously, that would cause them to do what he said to do in the first place, right? And so naturally, those who now speak Joey knees gather together, Right? Those who now are only stuck speaking, unfortunately, Pastor Billy knees, they go congregate over here. And the past people over here were speaking Tommy's, you're right there, and they go over that direction, right? Because they can only understand. And so what did it do? It caused them to scatter. And then they went out, like God said to do in the original thing, okay, and uh, begin to form their own societies, okay? And so this is the question. If this really happened right off the heels of a judgment from God, Noah's flood, then we should not only find one common language, which we do, but we should find one common point of origin, specifically in the Babel area, right? Where mankind went out and spread apart. Okay, if it's true, right? Well, guess what, Joe? We find all kinds of evidence. That's exactly what we find. And the first evidence is the historical evidence. Now, we're going to add to this another interesting thing. You talk about specifics. The Bible not only said that all of mankind had a restart in the Tower of Babel area. They did the tower, God confused the languages, and then they split and followed Joey and Pastor Billy and Tom, apparently. Right? But a second element of specifics, the Bible says, the Bible says it happened exactly in the time of this guy named Pele. 
Okay, so it wasn't just, there's a, it's all around the Babylon area. It specifically happened uh, in the time of this guy named Peleg. So let's take a look at that passage, Genesis chapter 10, verse 25 and 32. Two sons were born to uh, Eber, and one was named Peleg, because in his time the earth was what? Divided, right? So there, there's, your, there's your mark, right? They didn't just get scattered. They scattered specifically during the time of this guy, Peleg. His brother's name was Joktan. And these are the clans of Noah's son, according to their lines of descent within their nations. From these nations spread out over the earth after the flood. Okay? So you put it all together, and we see that it was during the time of this guy named Peleg, a descendant of Noah, that the earth was divided, began to spread out. Okay? So that's the question. Let's put it all to the test. Both passages now. Do we see any evidence of not only the nation spreading out from a common point of origin, specifically in the Babylon area, but do we see it specifically happening, if you start to do the math, in the lifetime of this Peleg guy? Yeah, and we're going to take a look at that evidence uh, now. Okay, first of all, the biblical dating puts the flood about 2349, 2348 B.C., give or take a little whatever. Okay, but if you run with those dates, okay, that puts the birth, if you chart the genealogies, that puts the birth of this Peleg guy about 2247 B.C., or about 100 years later, after the flood, this guy was born, Right? So there's your watershed mark. Now, uh, what's interesting is the historical evidence shows that it was precisely during this time that we see the nations of the earth not just springing forth from a single source, the Babylon area, just like the Bible states, but they began spreading out exactly during that time frame. Let's take a look at that. Here's Babylon. Remember, this is right where the Tower of Babel occurred, right? Okay, based on, this is secular historical records. The Chaldeans or Babylonians, the nation of Babylon, uh, right next to the Tower of Babel, was founded, they say, in about 2234 B.C. That's about 13 years, if you do the math, after the birth of this Peleg guy. Okay? So obviously, to establish a civilization, you don't just go there and it starts that day. It takes a little bit to get it going, build your city, and you get Babylon's born, right? So 13 years, according to the secular dates, from the Peleg guy, Babylon was founded. Then you got Egypt, okay? From another piece of historical evidence, Egypt was supposedly founded in 2188 BC, a little further away, down south, and that's 60 years after the birth of Pele. Okay. Then you look at Greece. Okay. Now, according to Eusebius, uh, Greece was founded about 2089 BC, even further away to the west, about 160 years after the birth of Pele. Okay. So you put it all together. This is what you get. Notice how even though all three nations were founded in a relatively short time from each other. Each one just happens to be speaking a completely different language. Did, did you catch that? Okay, but not only that, notice how Babylon was founded first, right? Which was the closest point of origin, right? Then Egypt was second, a little further away from the point of origin. And then finally, Greece was founded third, which is still further away from the point of origin, exactly like the Bible said, specifically in the days of a guy named Pele, right? I mean, I mean, think about what happened there. It's not only exactly in the time frame of this guy, but when these things are founded, these nations are founded, okay, they're, they're a little further and a step further away from the other one, but each one is speaking a completely different language. I mean, how does that happen? Right? What are the odds of that? I mean, not the same language that they say, well, I, I had a falling out with Joey, right? I'm tired of Joey and East, and so I'm going to go start my own civilization, right? But, and, but you would still be speaking the same language. These all founded in the same succession, completely different languages, exactly in the same time frame this Pele guy. Uh, it's exactly the biblical account. It's amazing. Then you take a look at the biological evidence, okay? One uh, logical thing you should also expect to find, if there was a worldwide flood, it's not only a single point of origin, but a single parent of origin, right? Because God hit a restart button, okay? And according to the Bible, all of humanity was reduced from millions, maybe even billions, we don't know, uh, to just eight people, right? If there was a flood, eight people, right? So then we should expect to not only find a common ancestor, but a recent one, right? Not what evolution says, millions of years ago, right? So if, we, if the biblical account is true, and there was a first judgment, a worldwide flood, we should find a recent common ancestor. Well, that's exactly what we found. In fact, the secular researchers have named her, I didn't, they call her mitochondrial Eve, okay? And even secular researchers admit that all of mankind can now be traced back to just one woman, and not just one woman, but a recent woman. Get this, this is wild. In a recent issue of Nature, a Yale mathematician presented models showing that the most recent person who was a direct ancestor of all humans currently alive, watch this, 
may have lived only just a few thousand years ago, not millions of years ago. That right there blows evolution out of the water, right? Perfectly agrees with the biblical account. In fact, this woman was most likely not the biblical Eve, even though they call her that. Most likely, she was one of the four women who survived the flood, okay? And as one reacher stated, quote, uh, maybe she was Shem's wife, but the mitochondrial Shem's wife theory doesn't quite have the same ring to it. So apparently that's scientific humor for you, Ruth. But uh, interesting. And again, you take a look at this and you go, wow, that's pretty interesting. Wow, it's a, it really agrees with the biblical account. And the point is this, it's not just interesting information, okay, about lineages, and it perfectly lines the Bible. But again, you take a look at this, you get confronted with this, or as a Christian, we share this with somebody, and even after looking at that, and if you still walk away and say, no, 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 it's not because you don't have a lack of evidence. It's because you've got a hard heart. You're scoffing, because you don't want there to be a God, and you're just running from the evidence. You're being will, willingly ignorant, exactly like the Bible said. Okay, it's not a lack of evidence. It's a hard heart. Okay, the third evidence we're going to deal with tonight uh, is the evidence of legend. Okay. And this was kind of common sense, right? Because you would expect that if there really was a worldwide flood, that somebody somewhere would be talking about the thing, right? It's a global event. And I'm talking specifically outside the Bible, right? And the reason why I think it's common sense, because if there really was a worldwide flood that affected all of humanity, then you would think that it's recorded somewhere else in the records of humanity, not just here, right? That's logical. Well, guess what we find? We not only find that in virtually every single culture on the planet, but to record that I've stated, uh, uh, checked out, we have about 500, 500 flood accounts from around the world. I'm just obviously going to hit a few of them tonight, the highlights of them, okay, uh, because I'd like to go home, and I'm sure you guys would too, unless you want to pull an all-nighter. And the silence was deadly, but let's move on. Uh, all right, uh, so I'm just going to hit some highlights. But folks, there's flood legends in every single culture around the planet. It's almost like there really was a worldwide flood. Let's start with the flood of Babylon. Now, remember, this is right next to the Tower of Babel, right? So what do they have in their records? Well, according to the Babylonian accounts, the pre-flood people were giants. Hey, wait a second. Did we see hybrids on Sunday and they did something? They were tweaking people and these great... Yeah, it's even in their writings too. Uh, giants who became impious and depraved, except one of them who reverenced the gods and was wise and prudent, according to the record. His name was Noah. Pretty close, right? And he dwelt with his three sons, Sam, Japheth, and Chim. Pretty close, right? And their wives were Tadia, Pandora, Noella, and Noegla. Okay, how many of you guys going to name your next cat Noegla? Somebody actually raised their hand. Okay. All right, but anyway, now Noah uh, foresaw the destruction, began building an ark. 78 years later, the oceans, inland seas, and rivers burst forth from below. That's exactly what the Bible said. The skeptic will say, It's impossible for the whole planet to be covered in water, uh, which is 40 days of rain. It's it. Well, read the Bible. It said it came from below as well as the earth cracked open and came from below. We'll get to that again later, Lord willing. Along with many days of violent rain, the waters overflowed all the mountains and the human race was drowned except Noah and his family who survived on his ship. The ship came to rest at last on top of a mountain. So this is the society that's right next to the Tower of Babel. They've got it written in their record. It's not just in the Bible, folks. It's all over the place and even in China. This one's wild. Uh, ancient Chinese writings refer to a violent catastrophe occurred to the earth. Not only is their language, as we saw, embedded with the flood of Noah, they still have writings that recount the flood of Noah. One classic is called Hai King in Chinese, okay, and it tells the story of a guy named Fu Hai, okay, and uh, whom the Chinese consider to be the father of their civilization. So it's not just a guy. This is the guy they believe who started their civilization. Well, let's take a look at that. The history records that Fu Hai, his wife, three sons, and three daughters, Oh, well, that's interesting. Uh, escaped a great flood. Okay, he and his family were the only people left alive on the earth. And after the great flood, they repopulated the world. Okay, in fact, in an ancient temple in China, there's a wall painting that shows Fu Hai's boat. Well, that's cool. Well, what's it look like? Well, the picture shows the boat in raging waters with dolphins swimming around it and a dove with an olive branch in its beak flying backwards or back towards the boat. Well, why don't you put that on the History Channel? Oh, that's right, because it would prove the biblical account and people couldn't scoff as much. Oh, I got, I got it, Tom. I got I to get there. Uh, how about India? The whole world is covered with these folks. Ancient records record in India, they say that a long time ago, there lived a guy called Manu, okay? And Manu was warned that a great flood would soon come and destroy everything on the earth. And he was instructed to build a large ship since the flood was going to happen very soon. 
The rain started and the waters rose until the whole earth was covered by water. And when the waters began subsiding, Manu's ship was on a mountaintop. India has an account of the flood. How about Greece, right? Well, according to their writings, a long time ago, humans became proud. And this bothered the gods, and the humans kept getting worse. Again, the Genesis account. It got so bad that mankind was continually wicked all the time. Okay. Finally, they decided that they would destroy all humans. Before they did this, though, they warned a man and his wife and placed them in a large wooden chest. The rain started and lasted until the whole world was flooded. Okay. The wooden chest came to rest on a mountain, and the man and his wife got out and saw that everything was flooded, and so they lived on the provisions from the chest until the water subsided. So even the Greece account happened. And of course, at the God's instructions, they repopulated the earth. Okay, how about the South Pacific? The whole world means the whole world, folks. It's in every culture on the planet. There's a Hawaiian legend that says long after the death of the first man, which would be Adam, the world became a wicked and terrible place to live. Uh, there was one good man left. His name was Nu'u. Okay, for them, Nu'u, right? And uh, he made a great canoe with a house on it and filled it with animals. And the water came up all over the earth and killed all the people. Only Nu'u and his family were saved. Okay, interesting. And how about Mexico? Now, this one is mind-blowing. Now, I'm not going to say, thus saith the Lord, but as you're going to see, maybe embedded in the uh, Toltec uh, tradition is the reason why they built the tower. Have you ever wondered that? Why in the world were you specifically building a tower? God says, get out there and repopulate the earth. Why did you build a tower? I know God judged you for it, and I know you rebelled against him, but why? Well, listen to what they have to say. First of all, they say, according to their histories in Mexico, is a story uh, account that the world, they say, the first world lasted 1,716 years, which is about close, roughly, with the biblical timeline, uh, and was destroyed by a great flood that covered even the highest mountains. Their story tells of a man named Tappy, who was a very pious man, and the creator told Tappy to build a boat and that he would live in and escape the destruction. He was told that he should take his wife and a pair of every animal that was alive into this boat. Now, naturally, everybody thought he was crazy. Until, of course, the rain started to come, and the flood came, and then they started tapping on his boat, Joey. That's why they call him Tappy. No, it's not, right? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, right? Uh, and, uh, but then the flood came. Oops, but it's too late. Then the men and the animals tried to climb the mountain, right? But the mountains came and flooded them as well. Now think about that. Why did God allow the rains and the flood to last for so long? And why did he specifically say that it covered even the above, what, 20 feet above the tops of the mountains? All right. Now I'm vertically challenged. I'm unfortunately not 20 feet tall. But mankind, obviously you're going to try to survive. And there probably was some, and they even have it in their account who tried to run away and make it to the highest point possible to survive. But God kept them coming. And maybe they did make it to the top of the mountain. But it kept coming and coming and coming and coming. And you're not 20 feet tall. Everybody went, right? Very amazing. Finally, the rain ended and Tappy decided that the water had dried up and he let loose a dove, okay? Following the great flood, people began to uh, multiply and they built a very great high tower. Why? to provide a safe place in case the world were destroyed again. Not going to say, thus saith the Lord, but isn't that interesting? We already saw that they tried to go to the tops of the mountains, couldn't make it, glub, glub, right? And so maybe that's why they were trying to build a tower. Once again, talk about the hardness of man's heart. Right after a global flood, you think that gets your attention. God says, get out there, repopulate. They says, no, like a defiant kid. In fact, this time, we're going to build something so high that even if you bring that flood again, now he already promised he wouldn't do it with the rainbow. So they're now not even listening to his word. I'm going to build something so high that I'm not going to glub, glub. God says, no. Shh, confused. Jesus. Isn't that wild? Embedded in the deal. Exactly what the Bible talks about. However, everyone started to, they even recount this. Everyone started to what? Speak different languages. And the people became confused. And so different language groups wandered to other parts of the world. Joey group went with Joey, Tom with Tom, and they even got this recorded for us. The Toltecs claim, in fact, that that's how they started, that they started as a family of seven friends and their wives who spoke the same language. So they congregated together, and they went on a journey. They crossed the great waters, which would be the Atlantic, lived in caves, and wandered for 104 years until they came to southern Mexico, and the story reports that this is about 520 years after the flood. 
all perfectly within the biblical time frame uh, and the account. Now, let's just take a look at the Americas, okay? Uh, one survey of 120 tribal groups in North, Central, and South America revealed flood traditions in every single one of them, folks. The whole world's got this thing documented, okay? And I'm just going to give you a synopsis of what every single one of these uh, accounts included. There was a general wickedness among men. Uh, God saw that a flood was necessary. Only uh, one family with eight members was protected. A giant boat was constructed. Uh, the family, along with animals and birds, went into the boat. Uh, the flood overwhelmed all those living on the earth. Uh, the deluge covered all of the earth for a time. The boat landed in a high mountainous area. Two or three birds were sent out first. Uh, the people left the boat with all the animals. Uh, the survivors worshiped God for sparing them. Uh, and a promise of a divine favor was given that there would never be another worldwide flood of waters. What does that sound like? That's right down the line with the biblical account and 120 different tribal groups, folks. It's right there. They nailed it. In fact, so overwhelming is this evidence of a worldwide flood. Listen to what this researcher said. You know, and again, put it in context with our world today. We talk about, oh, you really believe in Noah's Ark? You really think there was a flood? There's no evidence for this stuff. Listen to what this researcher stated in response to this account of so many flood legends. He said, quote, There are many descriptions of the remarkable event called the Genesis Flood. Some of them come from Greek historians, some from Babylonian records, others from cuneiform tablets in Mesopotamia, and still others from mythology and traditions of different nations. So that we may say, listen, that no event has occurred, has occurred either in ancient or modern times about which there is more numerous records than, and better evidence than this one. What did he say? Of all events that ever happened in the history of mankind, nothing has more evidence than a worldwide flood. That's what he's saying. So how in the world can you scoff at this? How in the world could you sit there and say, nope, nope, no evidence whatsoever for a worldwide flood. There's no evidence that God hates sin and that he judges the planet one time, so who cares if he's, you say he's coming back again? That's not true. The Bible says the reason why people actually say that today, especially when you bring this out, is because you're willingly ignorant. You don't want there to be a God. You want to be your own God. You don't want anybody to tell you what to do so you can continue to do your wicked sin. The point is, you need to take God up on his offer and stop being a scoffer and get into his ark made of wood, the cross of Christ, before it's too late. Because we're preaching the same message today guys and we get the same unfortunate response we're telling people that there's something coming from the sky you've never seen it before kind of like the rain back in noah's day the bible says that the uh, the garden of eden was watered with a, a mist so maybe there wasn't rain so here's noah sitting there preaching to that generation hey you're going to see this stuff come from the sky it's called rain and you better get into this ark or the whole planet's going to be destroyed we're saying the same thing hey d d jesus is going to come through the sky he's going to part the sky and he's going to come with thousands upon thousands and ten thousands of angels. And he's going to come and he's going to put this rebellion down on the planet. You better get in the ark before it's too late. The point is, people don't ha it's not that they don't have enough evidence. There's plenty of evidence. Unfortunately, we live in a scoffing society. The point is, you and I need to get out there and share this information to hopefully open their eyes. Because just like it was in Noah's day, one day, the door closed. And the scripture says the same thing's going to happen at the coming of Jesus. One day, the door to the banquet hall is going to be closed. And it's going to be too late. We'll close in prayer after this. As the descendants of Adam and Eve increased, so also sin increased. The earth became filled with evil. And God was grieved. But there was a man named Noah who followed God. And God gave Noah detailed instructions to build a huge boat called an ark. Then, God sent a male and female of every kind of animal to enter the ark. And after
after Noah and his family were inside the ark, God closed the door. Then, God made it rain for 40 days and nights, flooding the whole earth and destroying everything that lived on the earth. For 150 days, water covered the earth. But Noah and his family and the animals were safe in the ark. When the water finally subsided, the ark came to rest on a mountain, and the animals went their own way. And so it was that Noah and his family escaped God's judgment of evil in the world not because they were without sin, but because they believed God. Same exact message we're preaching today. Our world is just as wicked as we saw on Sunday as it was in Noah's day. God's given us a righteous, godly message to declare as the clock ticking. One day the door's going to be shut. But the message that we have to declare is listen, you can escape, just like Noah's family, this destruction, not because you can somehow be without sin, because we're not, but simply because you believed in God's provision to get into the ark of Jesus Christ. The same message that we need to get out today, and it's just as urgent as it was in Noah's time. Amen? Let's pray. Well, hi, this is Pastor Billy Crone of Sunrise Baptist Church and Get a Life Ministries, and I hope you enjoyed today's study. But in closing, before you go, let me ask you one final question. If you were to die today, are you sure that you go to heaven and not hell? You see, here's the problem. The Bible says that nobody automatically gets to go to heaven, and that's because God is holy and we are not. The Bible says that the wages of our sin or our unholiness, or the wrong things that we have done, have separated us from God. And the wages of our sin, or unholiness, uh, means that we deserve to die and receive God's judgment to go to hell and not heaven. In other words, we're disqualified for heaven. And that's because God being holy and us being not, the two cannot mix. So what are we going to do? Well, that's bad enough. The other problem is we don't even want to admit this dilemma even though God already knows it all. And so out of love, God gave us something called the Ten Commandments to show us that we're really disqualified for heaven. We're not holy, we're not perfect like Him. Uh, let's take a, a look at just a few of those uh, here today. Uh, the Bible says, the Ten Commandments says, you shall not bear false witness. That means lying. How many of you have ever told a lie before? Well, those of you who didn't raise your hand, you just did. Okay, let's be honest, folks. Let's not tell another lie. We've all lied. Well, believe it or not, that disqualifies you for heaven. That's how holy God is. He is the truth. He does not lie. And so that makes us a liar. Another of the Ten Commandments says you shall not steal. Okay? How many have ever taken anything without permission? Well, all of our hands should have went up at that one. Uh, we've already said we're a bunch of liars. Okay? Well, we've all done that. And it doesn't have to be a bank. Uh, it could be a pencil in the third grade. Uh, that means that we're a thief. Okay? The Bible says that God is so holy, even his name is holy. And that's why one of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not use the Lord's name in vain. Hey, folks, isn't it ironic how uh, now the blessed name of Jesus Christ, the Bible says there's no other name under heaven by which men might be saved, Jesus Christ, has now become a cuss word? Folks, the Bible says that's the sin of blasphemy. Okay, and folks, let's be honest. We've used God's name in vain uh, before. The Bible also says in the Ten Commandments, you shall not commit adultery. And Jesus takes the standard even higher. He says, listen, it's not just physical adultery. He says, surely I tell you that if you look at another person with lust in your eye, you've committed adultery in your heart. God looks at the heart. One more out of the Ten Commandments says, you shall not murder. And you might say, well, hey, I haven't done that one. Really? The Bible says that the sin of hatred is akin to the sin of murder. You, in other words, in your heart, wish they were dead. You pulled the trigger, if you will, in your own heart. And the Bible says God sees that 
and it's just as bad. He knows the mind, he knows the hearts, the thoughts, and the intents that we have. Folks, that's just five out of the ten commandments. How are you doing? Not very well. None of us can keep them. They're God's x-ray to show us that we're disqualified. And so when, not if, your time comes, because we're all marching towards the grave at different speeds, you're going to have to stand before God. And you're going to have to uh, say who you really are. He already knows. Hey, God, let me into heaven. Uh, I'm, I'm a liar. I'm a thief. I'm a blasphemer, adulterer, and a murderer. Folks, the Bible is clear. Such people as these will not inherit the kingdom of heaven. That's the problem. Here's the good news. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only begotten son, Jesus Christ, that whoever believes in him, what he did on the cross, on our behalf, that we will not perish, we will not go to hell, but he will give us the gift of eternal life. Jesus died on the cross to forgive us of all of our sins. It's something that we don't earn. We, we, we can't earn. It's a gift, the Bible calls it. And a gift cannot be earned. He was taking the death penalty in our place. That's what the cross was of the day. And that if we would just ask Jesus Christ to forgive us of our sins and believe that in our heart that God raised him from the grave, showing that his death is satisfactory to God to forgive us of all of our sins, no matter what we've done, the Bible says we shall be saved. Uh, the Apostle Paul says that if we confess with our mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God raised him from the grave, we will be saved. Let me give you a common analogy of what God's doing and what he did for us with Jesus dying on the cross on our behalf. Uh, in life, we know that people uh, can be sentenced for a crime uh, to where they're actually on death row. Uh, the courtroom scene has completely finished. The gavel has already sounded. Uh, they are going to jail and they're just awaiting their time before they go to the death penalty. Uh, as they're sitting there in the jail cell, uh, it, it's a proven fact they did what they did. Everybody knows it. They're just waiting for that time for their uh, number to come up, so to speak, and walk down that hall and be executed. Uh, there's nothing they could do to reverse their crime. No amount of good works in that jail cell can reverse what they've done. It's too late. It's over. But believe it or not, there's one way that people even today can get off a death row. And that's if the one in authority, the governor, if he were to, out of mercy and kindness, nothing that the person did, because they don't earn it and they don't deserve it, and they can't earn it, if he would grant them what's called a pardon, out of the kindness of his heart, he has the authority to grant them a pardon and absolve them completely of their crimes uh, against the state. And did you know that there's actually been people that this has happened to, that the governor, out of mercy, has granted them a pardon as a gift, and they've gone down to the jail cell and handed that person, extended it through the bars, here, I'm granting you a pardon. If you would just receive it, you can go free right now. And did you know that there's actually been people who've said, no, I don't want your pardon. And so what happened is of their own doing, even though they had a way out, they still had to go to the death penalty. Folks, can I tell you something? That's what God did for us with Jesus dying on the cross. He sent his son to take the death penalty in our place. He, God, has the authority to grant us through Jesus a complete pardon. And every day that you're still alive, God is extending to you spiritually this pardon. But a pardon does you no good unless you reach out and receive it by faith. Won't you do that today? Won't you call upon the name of Jesus Christ? Ask him to forgive you of all of your sins, to trust in his work on the cross, to pardon us from all of our crimes, our sins against God. God loves you. He wants a relationship with you. But there's only one way to heaven. It's Jesus. There's only one way to get off a of death row. It's through the cross of Jesus Christ. Won't you do that? right now well this has been pastor billy crone of sunrise baptist church and and get a life ministries and if there's anything that we can do for you uh please don't hesitate uh to contact us uh our number our information will uh come up here on the screen shortly and uh, uh if there's anything we could do for you please don't hesitate to let us know uh thank you for uh joining us and uh remember i hope to see you in heaven god bless Thank you for watching this presentation from Sunrise Baptist Church.
If you would like to send us a letter or any other kind of postage, you can reach us at 1780 Betty Lane, Las Vegas, Nevada, 89156. For more information, you can give us a call at 702-452-8599 or email us at bcrone at getalifemedia.com or you can visit our website at www.getalifemedia.com. Billy Crone and this ministry can also be found on Facebook and Twitter. Join us for services at www.sunriselv.com.